Welcome to Dornsife Dialogues. Many of our recent events have focused on weighty topics, the pandemic, the election, and a range of other complex challenges facing our nation and the world. Today, we're gonna have a little more fun. Uh, we're gonna talk about the food culture in Los Angeles. In a global city that's home to more than 140 nationalities, our diversity is expressed in many ways. Um, but none more quintessentially um, for Los Angeles than its incredible variety of cuisine. My husband and I often talk about the striking difference between his childhood in the 70s and 80s in the suburbs of Chicago and mine here in Los Angeles. For him, Italian food and one local Chinese restaurant pretty much express the range of culinary options. For me, by the time I was eight years old, I had my favorite uh, dishes mapped out in a whole range of cuisines from Thai, Chinese, Indian, Greek, Italian, Moroccan, and of course, my all-time favorite, Mexican. Um, the options have only grown in the intervening decades um, as the city has continued to attract immigrants from all over the world. And we see the traditional techniques and flavors being celebrated, but we also see incredible culinary innovation that comes from the cultural blending. And when it comes to bridging cultural divides, I think we all know that nothing compares to the simple act of sharing a meal. We are pleased to be joined today by a panel of experts who are going to take us on a tour of LA's food culture and explore how it connects to the larger narrative of our city and its future. Our conversation will be moderated by Michael Petiti, an assistant professor in our thematic option honors program. Michael publishes on American cinema and teaches courses in film, literature, food, and writing. His popular Maymester course called From Pueblo to Postmates, Food and Class in Los Angeles, uses food as a vehicle for understanding the diversity, culture, and history of our city. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Michael to introduce our panel. If you haven't had lunch yet, I wish you good luck in making it to the end of the event. Michael, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Dean Miller. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we uh, are actually down a panelist. Uh, Chef uh, Keith Garrett, Chef Ocho uh, won't be able to make it, unfortunately, today. Uh, but otherwise, I think we're still going to have a great conversation with the panelists that we do have. Um, I want to, uh, first off, though, thank the Dornsife team, everybody who helped put this together. Uh, Deanne, Jim, Sarah, especially Lance, uh, who worked tire tirelessly to help coordinate this. Uh, and in addition, I want to thank uh, Jesse and Mike, who are handling uh, IT today uh, for this event. So thank you all. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce the panelists that we, we have here. Uh, I'm going to quickly read the uh, bios that they, they gave me. Uh, first up, we have Kathleen Blackstone. Uh, Kathleen is the co-creator of Moonwater Farm, an urban food space created for collaboration, communing, and creation. Currently, Kathleen is earning an MS in Regenerative Studies at Cal Poly Pomona, where her thesis explores rebuilding the commons using an agro-ecological lens that values multiple knowledge systems. Um, as a master gardener, entrepreneur, urban shepherdess, and educator, she actively engages with the community of soil stewards, food sovereignty leaders, and placemakers. Her recent presentation, Food Within Reach, was chosen as a winning entry in Pando Populus's collegiate competition for LA County resiliency. Kathleen also sits on the board of Urban Saddles, a nonprofit expanding the equine experience for BIPOC community members. With her leadership, the team at Moonwater Farm has established a participatory model of planning and programming that centers diversity, inclusion, equity, and dialogue as a means to understanding different perspectives and interconnectedness. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I've also already been made a liar. We have, we have Chef Ocho with us here today, so I hope that's the last time I'm lying on this, on this uh, broadcast here. Uh, I'm going to actually move to, move to Chef Ocho right now. Keith Garrett, Chef Ocho. Uh, is one of the swelling legion of so-called underground chefs uh, operating in South Los Angeles. Chef Ocho's food truck, All Flavor No Grease, uh, which was originally parked outside of his family's home in Watts, has become a, a phenomenon. It's uh, since, since launched multiple trucks. There's even a brick and mortar now uh, at the Court Cafe in Westchester that uh, Chef Ocho runs with uh, others in his Food Minati crew. Uh, so Chef Ocho, thank you for joining. Uh, no worries, no worries. How are you this morning? Good, thank you. Yeah, we're just, I'm just introducing everybody and then we're going to get into the conversation. So looking excellent, forward to it. Excellent, 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 excellent. Uh, uh, next 
up we have uh, joining us from um, the Four Seasons, it looks like there. Uh, we have Chef Tran there. Uh, when Tran started an illegal restaurant called Starry Kitchen out of his and his wife's apartment. In no time, Starry Kitchen became the number one Asian fusion restaurant listed in Yelp. Uh, Starry Kitchen was best known for their tofu balls, which have since migrated nice. over to Button Mash, if you've spent any time there. Uh, Wynn became infamous also for uh, marijuana dinners before such a thing was legal in the city. Uh, Wynn has since graduated to crazier stuff, which includes wearing his patented banana suit. Not wearing it now, I can see though. Uh, and uh, since uh, Starry Kitchen, Chef has opened a barcade with a, a fan called Button Mash, which you can find in Echo Park. Uh, sometimes uh, Wynn appears on TV. He wrote a great cookbook. Uh, definitely worth looking into, and he's always weirdly failing upwards. Those are his words, not mine. I think I think he's just succeeding at life, honestly. Um, and then lastly, we have uh, Sochi Ruiz, uh, a lecturer in the anthropology department here at USC. Dr. Uh, Sochi, excuse me, Dr. Ruiz studies charitable food giving among older cultures in Colum uh, Colombia, Bogota, and has taught courses focused on food and belonging and food in the city. She is also a native of Los Angeles and is interested in immigrant food exchanges in Northeast Los Angeles. What a, what a lineup. Thank you all for joining. Um, you know, as, as Dean Miller mentioned, uh, many of you have been guests in, in my Maymester, uh, which is about food and class in Los Angeles. And uh, I think, I think you, you all have different and unique perspectives on that. I wanna leave a fair amount of time for the Q&A at the end, but I do have a, a kind of opening question that, that I wanna just throw out in general to all of you. And that question is a, kind of a free association, right? So when you hear the words food and Los Angeles, what comes to mind, right? Uh, what, what are some of your initial thoughts or reactions to those extremely broad terms? And you know, I, I could go on and on, and as Dean Miller made clear, uh, American film uh, cinema in general, right, is really my my kind of area of expertise and study, um, and so Los Angeles is is you know a, a wealth of material for that. Uh, but you know, teaching this class and being interested in in food and food ways in Los Angeles has also introduced me to you know a variety of other writings and and uh, approaches and topics. Uh, so. I don't want to spend uh, the time kind of rehashing the class, though. I want to instead throw it out to you all. What what does food in Los Angeles suggest to you? Uh, Was well, this for anyone? It is for anyone. Yeah. You go first, Pete. Well, I'll, if no one else speaks, uh, good morning to everyone. Good afternoon, rather. Um, when I hear food in LA, I don't know why, but and, and I'm not just trying to say this because I'm also in the in the Mexican food field, but the first thing that comes to my mind is taco. I don't know why. Like that's just the first thing, even though I know that's an authentic Mexican dish, but it's like when you hear about the first type of food anywhere around this area, I would say taco personally. And I think that's because a taco has been so like elevated throughout the years <laughs> it, it, it it bypassed just the traditional onion and cilantro so it's like it's so many different type of fusion tacos and variety of tacos nowadays and i think that a lot of them are based out of here in the la county area absolutely yeah i mean you know i would say 80 percent of my time is probably seeking out and eating different and, and new tacos throughout this city so uh, you could you could make a living doing it uh, Dr. Ruiz, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to add to that, but from a different perspective, because yeah, for me, tacos too, right? I grew up in East LA, tacos. But for me, like tacos on the street and in restaurants happened much later in life. It was about going to people's houses and every house you went to, you got a taco and a taco could just be like a tortilla with salt and lemon or a tortilla with like potato, right? Quieres un taquito? Do you want a taco? Right, it's kind of a right. way of like a way of like inviting people into your home. So I could go to four people's houses in one day and you get a taco in some way, right? So yeah, for <laughs> me as well, there's this kinship connection with tacos and Los Angeles. That's great, yeah. Can I speak up? Why do you put that? Hands up, hand up. Yeah, absolutely, please. I, uh, a couple, one is, I have to keep this PG, right? So no cursing, I don't curse. <laughs> Maybe PG thirteen, yeah. PG thirteen, yeah. and then it's, is it, 
uneffing believable wild wild west here in LA because there's so much stuff and I mean the word diversity comes to mind and not as a not as a buzzword as much as that there's so much culture that's re represented here in Los Angeles it's uneffing believable I mean you can get almost anything you're looking for in the world here and now even make it more specific and since my my focus generally speaking is Asian food I and I actually wrote this I think in a in my big book pitch like I consider Los Angeles the a Asian cuisine capital of, of America because you can find Japanese food Malaysian food Vietnamese food um you know South Korean food North Korean food um you can find Mandarin Chinese food Cantonese Chinese food you can find Burmese food you can find like um you can find some places you can find Macanese food there's not much Macanese food um but there's, there's so and there's there, and that that is just the tip of the iceberg and that is at least a representation of what I think LA represents in, in the sense that's also that we, the best part about LA and what allowed me and Keith, who I've met a couple times before too, um, allowed us to thrive is that we don't give a shit about Michelin stars. We, <laughs> like, we don't, like, you know what? The James Beard Award or his beard, we don't give a shit about that either <laughs> because we're LA. And you know what, we were, and, and I don't mean this, and we were shunned in the culinary community historically, but now we're like the pinnacle of that because I'd like to think, and I don't mean this as a buzzer, which is like, we kind of keep it real because it, the foods that are coming up in LA represent a lot of the culture and the history and the history of people, like I'm a transplant, I'm from Dallas, right? And it comes from all these people that originally descended on LA. You know, I used to work in Hollywood too, so I descended on LA with the, the dreams of Hollywood, but it, it spawns from that and dreams of other things like food, serving food out on the street, serving food from a booth. I serve food out of my apartment, serving food from a, I remember I, I first met Keith, um, he was serving out, uh, off a cart at a club in Hollywood. Um, but, and, but that's LA and that's not, that's not weird. That, that's who we are. And we, you know, everything from high end, so I wouldn't say low end to the, the more authentic experiences. That's what LA is to me and has embraced people like us and Keith. And I am number one, thankful for that. And number two, my mouth is really thankful for that too. <laughs> Kathleen? I was going to say bold. You know, there, there's a lot of uh, really creative talent that has, you know, busted out in the, yeah, I'm a native, but I grew up going to Bob's Big Boy. <laughs> so it wasn't until I traveled around the world that I understood the beauty of different cuisines. And then the other word is access for me because of where I sit in Compton and what I witness in the grocery store and the lack of really interesting food, having been spoiled, living on the West Side for 30 years and relocating it really shows these kind of two sides of the city uh, in terms of what is available. I think it's getting a lot better everywhere. Mm -hmm. People are talking about those issues uh, and we still have work to do. Yeah, and I, and I do want to address that and, and kind of bring up that conversation. Uh, in, in the meantime, though, I do think, you know, those were all great answers and it really speaks to the issue for me, because I do tend to get peppered with this question a lot, right? Like, you know, okay, where, where should I eat or what should I eat or what, what's, you know, the food scene in Los Angeles, right? And it, it, to me, the answer is, you know, whose food scene, right? Uh, which Los Angeles? And, and again, there's, there's a really, like Kathleen, you just mentioned, there, you know, and it's not just a, a west side or a south side or an east side or a northeast side, right? There, there are so many different Los Angeleses um and for me you know that was part of the the experience of moving out here from arizona was driving you know i went to the new beverly cinema quite a bit still i mean i i don't anymore because no one does anymore but i i, I did quite a bit up until the pandemic and driving through uh little ethiopia right and you know just there's there's a little ethiopia and then there's you know um the uh, Thai town in East Hollywood, right? And then there's the San Gabriel Valley and everything uh, in terms of, you know, everything from what, what uh, Wynn talked about in terms of uh, the various Chinese cuisines, Taiwanese cuisine, right? Um, but also, you know, the history there as well 
uh, of the Mexican population, Mexican American population in particular, right? Uh, you know, uh, talking about the mid 20th century in Los Angeles and, and that evolution and, you know, uh, what that's looked like. So for me, yeah, I think all of these issues, these issues circulate around anytime anybody asks or brings up the idea of food and, and Los Angeles. Um, I, you know, I have individual questions and we already have a question on the chat, but I just have one other question and, and I, I sort of teased it there, one more, more general question, uh, but it really is, you know, we're, we're all going to be living in two eras, right? The, the pre-COVID era and then the post-COVID era, um, hopefully soon, wow. um, right? And I, and I am interested, you know, uh, in in either your research and your studies and your your engagement with the community, Dr. Ruiz, but uh, as well uh, Kathleen, Wynn, and and Keith, you know, what what does the outlook seem to be, or what will it be for for you and your engagement with food in Los Angeles post COVID, post pandemic? What has it been like during the pandemic? Can you speak a little bit about what that experience is? has been like, and we can, we can maybe just do the same loop here. We could start with Keith again. Okay. Uh, it's so funny because I was actually talking to my booking manager, like right before I got on the Zoom call with you guys about the whole 2020 year. And it's funny because the last words that we said to each other was 2020 was actually great. <laughs> and it's 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 it's, un it's unbelievable because my heart goes out to all of the families who lost loved ones to COVID, everyone who was infected and infected by it. You know, my heart goes out to them deeply because it is real. You know, and this is the first time that <clears throat> in my lifetime that I've ever experienced a crisis like this. Uh, a pandemic it's like I, you know you read about it when you're in school like social studies and history class but to be a part of it was a whole different ball game <clears throat> but the day that they actually said that everything was going to close down I actually was really kind of like back against the wall and a little nervous because I know that this is really my only source of income right now and I was really kind of I was nervous because I didn't know exactly like what all was going to have to close down how long was it going to be closed down who all is it going to affect and it really had me thrown for a loop because all my, my whole staff looked at me like what's next what do we do because we're only really you know, out of the food trucks right now but once they had gave us the 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 notification that you guys are essential workers and the ways that we had to cater through it all it's like it was crazy because it's like it never stopped. It actually picked up for us a whole lot. And I was so grateful to God for that because I was really, really, really at a, a standstill point. Like, what will we do next? What am I going to do next? So I would really say, like, other than the people who lost their lives and who were sick by coronavirus, the pandemic kind of helped the to-go food industry, I'll say, in a big way. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was going to ask you. Is it, do you think, having started as a food truck and having, you know, started as, as uh, you know, a mobile uh, takeout to go kind of service, did that make it easier for you to make that shift or that pivot? Yes, sir. Once, once I thought about it, and I, because like I said, when it first happened, you know, everything was so chaotic. You was watching everything on the news. You was hearing people say things. So it's like you really didn't know which way to attack the whole situation. But once I buckled down and got my thoughts and my brain together and figured like, okay, boom, we're going to do it like this in order, A, B, C. And then everything just really started flowing after that. That's great. And yeah. it really, it really, really, really was a shocker because a lot of the how could I put it? A lot of the COVID relief funding that went around for a lot of small businesses and everything, mm -hmm. I actually wasn't able to get any of those, you know, funds or get any sources to even get any of them. So just for us to be able to sustain through the storm really was like, like I said, I'm grateful for it. Grateful yeah. because like I said, I was one nervous camper. Yeah, no, no doubt. Well, well, that's, that's great to hear. Uh, Dr. Ruiz, do, do you have a, a thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so I don't necessarily have some idea as to how things will be. <laughs> right. But I've 
I've been teaching classes about, about food throughout the pandemic and our classes had to change in the spring, right? Because we started doing um, learning through Zoom. And so one of the things that I've done with my students is instead of writing the standard paper is they, I asked them to write a paper about how their lives have changed in relation to food because or in, in the context of the pandemic. Um, and it's really interesting to hear like everyone has a story, a food related story, right? Um, either having to start eating alone all of a sudden or the kinships that one has with grandparents and like delis. I had one student who would meet her grandfather in a deli, in a Jewish deli every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And now like that space isn't there, but neither is her connection to her grandfather in the same way that happened through food every Sunday, right? Yeah. Um, and so like, it's been, I think, a really good process for us to just kind of reflect on the fact that things have changed and how. Um, I also think just uh, two more points that so much of the kinds of inequalities that you know we teach about became very visible and visceral during um, since March, and I think it was a really important time to kind of study these issues in the classroom and for people to have kind of broader conversations about them. Right? What kinds of access to food do we have? What happens when we don't have access to food? Um, what kinds of like there a need? Like one of the conversations is a need for more sustainable, right? Yeah. Kind of um, system for our, our food system, um, and because there's there is food, there's a lot of food, um, and that's the history of it, right? Of mm -hmm. scarcity is the food is it's there, we just don't have access to it, right. um, and so I think that's in stark relief right now, and it's kind of this stuff that led me to start thinking about how I can think about how. Um, people, especially like uh, I live in an immigrant neighborhood and I grew up in this neighborhood in Lincoln Heights. Mm -hmm. um, and so I moved back when I came back from my PhD research and stuff. And my neighbors, we've always, we've always um, recirculated food, right? Mm -hmm. Someone has access to a food bank that gives them food. So we all have tomatoes or someone has a guava tree or someone has X, Y, and Z. And that has become even more prevalent during the pandemic, where there are like bits of toilet paper associated with that and a range of other things and the kinds of networks that are created in the context of difficulty, I think are really important to talk about as well. That's a great point. Yeah. And, and again, food is such a communal uh, thing, right? It, bring, it brings yeah. people together and has historically. And I think that that kind of speaks to, okay, well, what, what do we do or how do we, um, you know, approximate that when we actually can't come together, right? Mm -hmm. And it's things like uh, communities, neighborhoods, uh, food banking, and, and just resources, networking, right? Yeah. Uh, Wynn, did you have a, a thought on it? Oh, a lot, but you know, I'm just an opinionated person. Um, <laughs> and, but but, here, but here, here's the real, my, my answer is kind of two different answers. One is, you know, we're part of this place called Button Mash. It's 4,000 square feet. Um, it, operates on crowds, it operates on that energy, it has video games, pinball machines, we fit 150 people in there, and it's shut down right now. Yeah. And it's shut down either permanently or not, we're not quite sure. Um, it, it just, no amount of food sales can sustain, not no amount, but not, it needs to sustain such a high, uh, a higher threshold of food sales than normally afford to sustain paying rent and making the bills. And, you know, and actually the restaurant now, it's just a big storage space because um, that's just, you know, no one can come in. So it's like, we can just use it for storage. And the kitchen was the only thing that was active and we did delivery. And, but the thing about that is unique is that for me is that I'm, I'm only a partner, I'm not the owner, right? So these fans that I partner up with, they're the owners and I, I, would, I was advising them. And part of my advice to them it sounded pretty cynical. I was like, you should just shut down for a while. It's like it's the best thing you can do versus biding your time because I even at the very beginning of this pandemic and part of it comes from my experience you know when I started out of our apartment that is a great story but it happened out of the fall of the economy and economically speaking I saw this as exactly the same thing it's like something so financially catastrophic and something with such such an indefinite timeline that you don't know how it's going to end going to play out mm -hmm. and I already thought that this is going to destroy a lot of restaurants, but does it destroy the restaurant business, which is a much bigger question? I don't think it does. Like with any business that gets shaken up, you know, a lot of times what happens are is the bottom falls out. So the people, unfortunately, that can't sustain for months without making money, they fall out. A lot of the big boys actually 
start dropping off too because they, they, they start realizing their businesses aren't making as much as they can. But a lot of times it's the middle people that, and like Keith is a really good example, right? Cause he was, um, he started as a carp, but then he, he grew his business, but he didn't grow it to an extent that depended on like a large restaurant like we did, right? As um, you know, I've been to his brick and mortar in Santa Ana, um, which is like a stand inside the, uh, it's great, um, mm-hmm. inside of like a market. Um, and he has the food trucks. He was able to adapt and look, and he, and I'm glad you said that you didn't even get all that financial help. Like you were able to adapt and thrive. And, and it's not just people like him. It's also people like with, so it's like us, like we met, I met this guy that started a pizza, like a deep dish, like a, it's a um, Detroit pizza thing. Mm-hmm. All these, I'm not going to say, I, I'll just say all these like illegal operators are popping up because they have nothing better to do, but there's also serving a need. And those guys are going to be the new talent, right? Because they're, they, they're, fe- they're feeding a need. Part of the need is they need to make income. Mm-hmm. Part of the need is people need to eat. And there is a special need in the city of Los Angeles and not Southern California that we want exciting experiences, even during a pandemic, even, even during the financial uh, you know, uh, collapse. And that is exciting. Like you don't have to, you can be socially distant. You can go pick up, it's in, um, it's in downtown LA. You can pick up, you know, this um, Detroit pizza, or there's this guy doing these like family style Italian dinners that look amazing. They're really inexpensive too, right? You can feed a family four. It's like, and this guy's actually Italian mm-hmm. and he gives you uh, lessons on how to teach it. And it's like for 20 to $30 and feeding four people, you know, that's better than restaurant prices. It's, it's more than cooking for yourself, but still someone's cooking for you. Uh, it's, it's a very, it's very complicated. And the last part of that is I personally, um, I hate to admit this and it's very much more deep than this, but I, we, me and my wife who are the chefs of Star Kitchen slash Button Mash, we don't want to cook for our primary income anymore. But what I saw at the pandemic, cause I'm so, I was, it seems so similar to a financial um, collapse. The first day of the pandemic, I told my wife, okay, here, we're going to pivot now. This is not a vacation. Like we're going to be on a schedule. This is exactly like a financial collapse and we're going to figure out what the next step is. And if we don't figure it out now, we're never going to have that opportunity ever again. Mm-hmm. So it's both sad, conflicted, you know, absorbing my quality of life to have more time with my child. Um, but as a fan of the restaurant business, it, the, the short term is it's really sad because a lot of my colleagues are losing their restaurants um, and there's nothing I can do about that. But I'm also excited about the new talent, the new voices that will come up from that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, life will go on, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen, what, what, what are you seeing or, or what's your perspective in terms of, you know, food justice and, you know, the food communities that you're working with or, or serving or, you know, working to educate, right, um, you know, with your farm and, and your, your uh, organizations that you're involved with? What is, what is COVID-19 19, uh, 19 looking like or impacting uh, in terms of all of that? Well, like uh, Keith, we did not get any support money either. And it, I, so we kind of tried to come up with ideas like, okay, how can we bring in revenue? Because it was field trips and school kids and lots of people coming in and talking about the system. And, and we have a small urban lot with fiber goats and milk goats and food. So we had a you pick with our mulberry tree that was extraordinarily successful. And that was the first couple months of the pandemic. And then we were awarded a grant from the Risa Foundation that we didn't ask for. Those were people that had been here before and seen the work. And that has allowed us to run our summer camp where we partnered with uh, Root Down LA, who is our long-term partner and they just changed the setup of the way that the kids work so we have a communal kitchen and we couldn't do that anymore and we have a table that seats 20 that now takes nine Mm -hmm. Uh, so we shifted like that to be able to make the space safe but really provide continued outdoor access for people around food And we also had baby goats this year. So that was very popular and people came and milked and pet the animals. And we ran um, refuge for people who were in the uprisings during the summer. Mm -hmm. And that was free of charge so that if people needed to recharge their batteries after those activities, 
they can use this space to come and, um, you know, kind of repair and renew. I think one of our sadder pieces is that our chef pop-up dinners can't happen anymore. So we turned around and supported those chefs that we know by buying from them. And we also donate money to our colleagues at Alma Backyard Farm who are very active in the Compton community every two weeks giving away grocery bags, the, the, the kind of work that Sochi is researching in older communities. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the ways that we've responded to the events this year. And we will continue the after school program in the spring and that is chef driven and uh, kind of ecologically driven. So there's a nature component and then there's a food component, including we did herbalism for youth so that they have an opportunity to, you know, make teas and try different foods. And um, that was, we were able to offer that for the first time for free mm. to local residents. So I hope that we come up with some ways to create smaller events we we don't depend on 150 people showing up right so if we can have 10 20 in the space on a regular basis that is probably what 2021 is gonna look like for us great yeah yeah i i think those were really uh you know enriching and, and interesting perspectives on on something that we're all dealing with, right, currently, and and we, none of us really have any kind of insight into what the future is going to look like, or or how it's going to resolve itself, and then what life will look like once it has resolved itself. Um, I do think, you know, it really does speak to Los Angeles as well, though. You know, when when people ask or or wonder about what is Los Angeles, I mean, it's really you know these panelists, right, and everything that they've talked about in the communities that they're serving and the people in those communities. And that's why I always feel optimistic about Los Angeles, because I do think, you know, people are out there working, um, even if you don't see it, right? Uh, it's, it's happening on a daily basis, and it's happening in moments of crisis and moments of, you know, calm, and then also moments of, you know, a, a boom, a relative boom as well. And that's kind of true to the origin of this city, too. Um, I want to, you know, if you, if you have questions, please go ahead and uh, feel free to uh, throw it on the the Q and A here. Um, th there are a couple, and uh, Chef Tran has been nice enough to to respond to them. But I am I am sort sort of interested, and in, again, to kind of like move from the the weighty topics into the more uh, exciting ones that Dean Miller kind of uh, previewed for us here. I'm interested in uh, the first couple questions that came came in. Um, the first question was, what are some undervalued cuisines, foods that haven't been discovered yet by the culinary mainstream? So again, we have you know literal tastemakers here, but like, what, what, what would you say, uh, you know, people aren't maybe blogging about, uh, people don't blog anymore, uh, Instagramming about, right, or TikToking about, or whatever the case might be, uh, that they should be talking about in terms of uh, the, the food scenes in LA or food in Los Angeles? What do you all think? Um, I wrote, I wrote African food, that's what I wrote was one thing. And I, and I speak that from, from personal experience because I, um, I, I live in Van Nuys and there actually happens to be an African restaurant, um, cuisine restaurant, like five, 10 minutes from my uh, place called Toto's Cuisine. Mm. And, but it makes me think about like, well, I don't really know much about African cuisine. And I, I, I do think whatever term you want to give LA being a melting pot, like we, the, funny, the fun part about LA is it draws people from so many different places, not just from America, from all over the world. Um, and the fun part about that, and a great example of like, you know, there's been a huge influx of like mainland Chinese people now flooded into America, but LA especially, and what they brought with them is their cuisine, right? But their, their cuisine, what I mean, like is they're bringing like the new style Sichuan cuisine, not what Americans thought Sichuan cuisine was, but like the stuff that's like the, you know, what I can't even think like, there's this like boiling fish. It, it, doesn't have a great name, at least in the literal translation, but it's like fish pieces that's boiled in oil. And I, I always think it's soup. I always want to drink it, but it's not. It's oil. It's oil. <laughs> but it swims in this oil. And it's delicious. Um, but back to like, well, it's hard because we represent a lot more than I think 
people realize and maybe it's because I, I live in a bubble too because I live in LA and I don't necessarily follow entirely what the trends are in either food media or Instagram or blogs do exist still a little bit um I mean I eat so much food I'm so curious about I mean there's little Ethiopia still exists but there's not as much Ethiopian food outside of that mm -hmm. um you know, Filipino food was supposed to be the next big thing. And it actually took like five years after it was claimed to be the next big thing. Yeah, um, yeah. But those chefs have really come up as well. Um, I don't know. And I mean, the Cambodian and yeah. the Long Beach. Oh, food. so good. Yeah, I would say that that is a really good undervalued cuisine, right? You don't get a lot of Cambodian food. And, but there's also a mixture of Cambodian Vietnamese down there because it's, it's a mix, you know, because if you follow the immigration patterns of people, um, down there and oh, now you got me thinking about getting this noodle soup over there so what, what, i mean i can't even think about places. i don't know the names of the dessert pieces that i, I find i'm uh, i'm a big dessert person so i'm always interested in these sort of not super sweet desserts that these other cuisines have i like those yeah yeah and you got me thinking of chengdu taste with the the fish and the oil. i mean I treat it like a soup anyway. I'm addicted to heat. So, I mean, I just, the Sichuan peppercorns and the jalapenos cut up in there. I, I, I consume it. I love it. Uh, I, I'll take all penalties that it, that it uh, gives me. Um, uh, Chef Ocho, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you, your, you know, your decision, uh, I mean, your, your cuisine or the cuisine that you're making is a, is a kind of fusion cuisine. How did you come about that? And like, do you see, you know, with Blue Kitchen or Tacos Mel, right? Some of the restaurants involved in the court. Um, do you do you see those as like the the next trend or suggesting the next trend? It's mighty funny you say that because I was trying to think and become like distinct. Like Ian was like like a specific type of dish, like how he said African food. But I was more over thinking like, damn, it's a lot of different foods out here. Like a lot of them, but. A lot of them haven't took the approach of the fusion level yet, as far as putting more to it and making the whole dish like just blossom more. Like I was even thinking like sushi. Sushi has been so traditional since it came out here. And don't get me wrong, the the plating of it is all beautiful, but it's like I haven't seen any like over the top or over the you know something that's like wow with sushi yet. So it's like. That's more over like what I'm on now, the wildness of a lot of dishes. Because like I was just talking yesterday with some buddies, I said, I'm seeing a lot of beautiful, beautiful, beautiful dishes. But then it's like, they're probably bland or not even tasting like nothing. But then you got a few dishes that's bomb, like bomb, bomb, bomb. But then it's like, they don't look like shit, nothing. So it's like, why would I try that? So it's like, you have to combine the two. And I know I always get like, you know, kind of so spiritual at times, but I know like the quesadilla, it came to me in a dream, straight up. It came to me in a straight dream. And the way I was able to even first cut it, I was getting talked about by some friends in the front yard while I was on the grill. Like they was making little fat jokes and stuff and I had the cleaver in my hand. I was like, won't y'all just shut up? And then I looked at the quesadilla, I was like, how I do that? Like, that was just like the dream I had. So once, you know, I kept practicing at it, practicing at it. Now anybody who I see cut a quesadilla over five or six pieces all over the world, I know where it came from. And I feel good about that. I don't have to get the recognition from everybody, but it's like I know for a fact where that came from. And mm -hmm. it's like, I'm grateful that that took the whole quesadilla to a whole nother level. Yeah. Yeah. That made quesadillas fusion. People want to know about. People want to see more. People want to try more. So it's like I would want to see more over the top dishes done. Period. I wouldn't care what kind of food it is. Vietnamese food, Mexican food, African food. I don't care. Just show me something outside the box with it. Right, and that's a uh, you know that that makes me think of the uh, you know the the famous Roman. Uh, Apicius, right? Uh, we eat first with our eyes, right? And uh, right. we're talking like first century uh, Rome, right? But I mean, like that's been there, you know, so I, I think there's often this, oh, Instagram is ruining food or, oh, Instagram is really making us, you know, obsessed with just how it looks and not how it tastes. But I think your point is really, we do actually like first I eat with, yeah. I personally think that Instagram is just setting the bar for a lot of people that's in a comfort zone in the lanes that they're in. Because it's like, damn, 
you're seeing a burger that look like this. Then you turn around, look at somebody like Billionaire Burger Boys, or you look at a burger like at the Court Cafe with filet mignon and lobster, like, what the hell is that? But then you go taste it, and then it's amazing, too. So it's like, I think the people that's, that's been, like I said, in their comfort zones, it makes them feel uncomfortable to see the new dishes that's coming apart. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Ruiz, real quick, before we move on to the other questions. Oh, I think you're, you're, you're muted. Um, I was more thinking about um, Keith's answer, actually. Um, well, well, I think one of the things that he was getting at is that beauty is one of the ways by which we eat, right? That sensory perception where we feel our way through food, we smell our way through food, right? We talk about food. Some of my cultures argue that talking is one of the senses and like the Western context, we don't necessarily think about it in that way. We experience, right? And so um, just to kind of think about that aspect of taste involves all of those things. Um, but in terms of like a food that doesn't get much um, recognition, it's not that it doesn't get much recognition, but I think thinking about, um, for example, like Mexican food, that's the cuisine I know the best just because it's what I lived on, like what fed me as a child, right? right. The, I think the recognition that there are so many different regional versions of this, right? We have kind of national ideas about what a cuisine is, like a taco and a burrito, which is actually very located in um, the El Paso, like Juarez area. That's where the burrito kind of was born, right? Mm -hmm. um, but really think about all the regional kind of um, foods, like the food from Veracruz or the food, um, there is like a, I think Oaxacan Middle Eastern restaurant, right? In East LA, right? So the kinds of like, because of the histories in different parts of the world, um, to really highlight that regionality um, and kind of, and that happens in every context, right? It's just the context I know best. Um, and so part of what I've been trying to do is like find those places, right? To try to learn even just about, not just Los Angeles, but about the different places where, you know, different parts of Mexico kind of through bite by bite, you know, in LA. Yeah. And I do think, I mean, especially I, I, I'm coming from Arizona, Mexican food was really in, in uh, you know, my, my top bracket before I moved to Los Angeles and Los Angeles has done nothing to like move it, move it to another bracket, but it really is like the regional style, the Sonoran style, uh, you know, Yucatan style. Right. I mean, so it is like, I, I'm finding, you know, which by the way, you're, you know, uh, many of you maybe are, are at USC, Mercado La Paloma, Chichen Itza, right, right next door. So you can try that, that Yucatan style. Um, I want to, I want to make sure that we can cover these questions. Somebody asked about the undervalued, uh, or sorry, somebody asked about uh, how we absorb national food trends, and, and Chef Ocho, I think you already sort of talked about that, right? How you can see the influence of your quesadillas. I mean, there's obviously Kogi, right, in terms of the, the you know, uh, Korean-Mexican fusion that really- Shout out Roy Choi. Yeah, was, it's born here, but I mean, now you can, you can find it, you can find that everywhere, right? Um, and then, and then Chef Tran, I mean, you talked about Detroit style pizzas, which I, I see are really making a, a push out here, right? So I mean, yeah. LA, LA is interesting in that it does absorb and it creates and it perpetuates, you know, it's, it's sort of doing all of that simultaneously. Um, any, any specific thoughts about that question? I, I think a really good example, of a, a, a trend that's not ours, but I forgot blew up here. And I, I, at least I think in terms of how I was tracking it was hot chicken, right? Like, like hot chicken is not from here, right? right? From, from Tennessee. Right. But when Hal and Ray's came on the scene, then it blew up the country. Then I saw it at KFC. <laughs> then I saw it at Panda Express, right? And, and you know, we, like, yeah, I think you're right. I think it kind of ebbs and flows. Like trends come in here. We also they're also born out of here. But I, I, I go back to the idea that we're the wild, wild west. Like we don't have a set kind of, and you know what, I, I give a lot of this credit to, and, you know, rest in power, a good Jonathan Gold, you know, was, you know, who was a big proponent of ours too, is like, you know, my Jonathan Gold being um, the former LA Times food reviewer, Pulitzer Prize winner, but he's unlike any other food reviewer, at least until up until that point in time, you know, my best version of that I could I could example that that will help kind of paint this picture is I remember reading this review of all these food reviewers around the country, these elite food reviewers, right? And they're asking each one of them, if you had one last meal, 
before you die, what would you have? And I can tell you, like, if there were like 40, there was like 49 food reviewers, all of them were Michelin star restaurants, every single one of them. Then they got to Jonathan Gold. He goes, just stick me in San Gabriel Valley and I'm happy. That was literally his answer, right? But he it was representative of that movement that we, I think we placed more value on actual flavor than culture and history and what that, those flavors represent. Um, you know, whether it just be that specific culture or the history of how it's changed in LA. And honestly, that, a lot of that, you know, fusion as a whole, I think like we, I think fusion happens naturally. Like I'm, I grew up in Texas, mm -hmm. right? And we like, one of our other dishes we're really famous for is a Singaporean chili crab. But we, and in Singapore, they make it with a, a, a steamed bun, it's fried. Mm -hmm. But we decided to make a savory beignet, which is like from, from our time, like in Texas, we go to New Orleans a lot. Right? We made a savory beignet to make with the Singaporean dish. And, you know, I wouldn't initially call that fusion, but, that is, but, but uh, uh, you know, if you analyze it, it is. Um, it's just a fun place to explore. And it's a city that doesn't have any pretense. Because if it's good, it doesn't matter if it's fusion. It doesn't matter if it's from here. It doesn't matter if it's from somewhere else. It doesn't matter if your mom stole it from some, some dude that he, she met, like when she slept with him, like, 10 years ago and then took a recipe <laughs> and messed with it. Like LA doesn't care. Like we, we like it, we like it. And the thing about it, the last piece of that is the LA food media is really, really unique uh, across, compared across the country. I remember I, I did this thing with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm friends with Roy Choi and uh, Michael Patagio, and we did this thing for Oreo in New York. And I, I got to present cause I'm the talky one out of the three of us. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, there were all these food writers in New York, right? And I made this comment like, hey, so like when all you guys like, you know, hang out like the end of the day and eat with each other, you know, you guys have a lot of fun, right? And it, it was like a cold room. And they're like, we don't eat with each other. I'm like, what? Like, we don't know each other. Like, what? Like, you know, we try to scoop each other on reports. Why would you want to know each other? I'm like, mm. but that's the way, L and that's the way LA is. All the food writers here in LA, they're friends. And it's not just their friends, they're friends with us. They know a lot of us. I met Keith through a food writer, right? That's actually like, and that, but that is LA. Like the city of LA, the culinary side of it is built by the people that are part of that community, both the culinary side of it and the people that write about it. And I think that's why our trends can go farther. It's not as a concerted effort to be like, you know what, we're gonna put LA in the map as much as like, hey man, we like LA, we like our food. We're just gonna write about it and talk about it. And if anyone takes it, you know, picks it up, great. If they don't, don't care. We still live in LA, we get to enjoy it. And I'd add the farmers too, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's a real, real connection with the people growing our food that are local as well. You look at Wiser Farms, or mm -hmm. you know, there's a whole bunch of people that are really engaged in growing the food, connecting to chefs. And you look at some of these really progressive farmers on the East Coast that are talking about building a more collective system, right? That the, the, the chefs, the farmers, and the, the, the reorienting the market. And I think that's something that has serious potential in this urban space because of these relationships he's talking about. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, we went, not this past year, but two years ago with the, the summer class that I teach, we actually went to the Santa Monica Farmers Market, mm -hmm. uh, the one that's held on Wednesdays, the, the massive one. Um, and, uh, I think that's just such an interesting space to be because you are, I mean, there are chefs from, you know, and, and, uh, food workers, right. From all the restaurants of Los Angeles out there kind of, uh, harvesting and getting their, their, uh, produce for the, the weeks. Right. Uh, but in addition, right. There's just, you know, people who, who are interested in food and produce, people who are connected with the farms and, uh, the the show shows about that farm, right. With Evan Kleiman. I mean, it, it's a very extensive network around food in this city. It, we it's all amazing. It very seriously. And I think we're really privileged because of the environment that we live in, that we have extraordinary, you know, list of ingredients on any day of the week that we can get locally or that's coming in, but this is the first stop right? Exactly. The fish, the, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things. And, and everybody who's running one of these stalls, right? The farmers are, are there and they are happy to talk. And I mean, students were, were blown away. I mean, again, they're getting entire, you know, uh, history lessons about agriculture in California, um, just talking to the people growing the food. And again, that's a, that's a wonderful opportunity that LA does allow, right? And it's not just at that Santa Monica farmer's market, but it's at all of the 
farmers markets right throughout uh, because we're kind of strapped for time I, I see all of these questions and I feel like I could probably like pinpoint them to each of you individually so I'm going to do that uh, we'll just like try to throw a question to everybody and maybe wrap it up with that uh, chef Ocho there's a question from somebody from Turkey uh, who wants to know a little bit about LA's food truck scene. Uh, what's the place of food trucks and LA cuisine in general and how has it, or is it changing LA's food culture? And I think you could speak to that, that wonderfully. Yeah, well, the food truck scene has actually picked up tremendously, especially like after I got on the scene in like 2016, I can't even refer to you. I start seeing trucks pop up out of everywhere. I even seen a lot of restaurants start closing down and then opening up more food trucks. I even seen restaurants stay rolling and then open up food trucks as well just to start covering more ground. So I would have to say, like, it, the food truck scene flourished because, as you know, the, the Lanchetta was considered a roach coach, you know, and nobody wanted to go eat from no food truck. Now, 2020, what? It's what food truck do I want to go to now? Right. It's like you can literally, bro, go to a different food truck every day of the week, probably a different one for probably a month straight or even more than that. And it's like it never, ever, ever been like that because every truck was typically just white and selling all of the same stuff, sandwiches, chips, and maybe a taco or, you know, something that was already warm in the warmer. Mm -hmm. But right now, since so many new aspiring chefs that came on the scene, since – so many people just been thinking outside the box lately that's been inside of the food industry. It's like a lot of people is taking the truck route because it's it's not only a little bit easier, but you can cover more ground. Mm -hmm. Like me, I don't I can literally say I done been through a big chunk of California, all the way from the bay, all the way down to San Diego. And it's been fun. It's been a mission. Yeah, no doubt. Thank you. Uh, and again, the, the history of food trucks is in, in Los Angeles, but, uh, you know, in the U.S. is really worth looking into. Um, you know, you have the tamale wagons, right? Um, and again, of course, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, racism, like, like uh, Chef Ocho mentioned, right? The way that we used to view these trucks or think about these trucks. But now, yeah, they are destination dining. It's where you're going to go, right? Uh, when, you, when you get off the plane in Los Angeles. Thank you, Chef. Um, uh, Sochi, uh, there's a question that actually asks for this favorite unknown spot to eat in USC or the downtown LA area. I feel like because, you know, we, we spend, or we used to spend a lot of time at USC, maybe you could, you could answer that one. I'm muted. Um, in terms of like, I'm, I live closer to um, HSE, so the Health Science Campus, so not far from downtown, so I have more context for that area, mm -hmm. right? So there's this really good, the one Mexican restaurant that I will go to is El Huarachito. Um, mm -hmm. Huarachito is H-U-A-R-C-H-I-T-O, because like I eat such good Mexican food at home, I have a hard time eating it elsewhere, because it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's not my grandma's food kind of thing, right. right? But that's a really good one that I really enjoy. There's um, like places um, on Main Street that is just a supermarket. It's called Korea Supermarket, and they sell ceviche on uh, to go like a pound for eight dollars. And um, on like Uber Eats now, yeah. so there's like places like that where you can get. They're just kind of small restaurants run by families or supermarkets run by families that are producing a lot of really yummy food for the community, right? In a context where there are also not a lot of supermarkets. There are some, but just providing healthful food in that way. Um, there's another question that I thought would be interesting to answer, if you don't mind. It's something yeah, about vegan and vegetarian food in the oh, country, um, in regards to people of color or communities of color in LA. Um, there's a huge movement toward this, which I find really interesting. There's um, a lot of like vegan taco trucks, like Taco Sin Karma, or um, also there is uh, books about decolonizing your diet. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to like, thinking about the kinds of grains and seeds and like chocolate and the very kind of whole foods that were used in the con prior, to pre prior to colonization. So there's a cookbook called Decolonize Your Diet. And then there's also a cookbook by um, uh, uh, Jocelyn Ramirez called La Vida Verde. And mm -hmm. she writes, uh, she, it's a vegan cookbook, um, um, Mexican cookbook, right? Where she uses hibiscus for tacos. Mm. Um, and she was about to open a brick and mortar restaurant in the community in Lincoln Heights right before the pandemic, right? Mm. So there's a huge, a, a lot in South LA and Lamarck Park. So yeah, there's a huge movement, I think, that is burgeoning right now. 
That's great. I, I was also going to ask Kathleen if she, if she had any insight into that question as well, but that, that was wonderful to hear, Dr. Ruiz. I would only add to that, I mean, Jocelyn uh, started um, across our kitchen table for mm -hmm. shelves of color that is particularly uh, focused on women chefs. And we have a lot of people who program in this space. So we really want this space here for the community to put together what it is that they're looking for. And most of those events are in fact vegan food that are, you know, coming from uh, backgrounds like I think Keith's and mm -hmm. um, are bringing in food that they're selling out in the community in various ways, not necessarily in a traditional brick and mortar. And I guess for me, being the outsider looking in, I wonder if it's also a sense of control to be able to finally have this, you know, diet that is very clearly healthy and good for you and kind of goes against the redlining that has taken place in this city and kept good food away from a lot of people of color in Los Angeles. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm. This is actually the last day of classes if you're teaching Tuesday, Thursday classes like me, and I am currently eating into one of my last sections right now. So, uh, Wynn, I'm going to throw the last one here to you. Um, uh, and Dr. Ruiz, if you see that note, if you wouldn't mind providing the, the name there on the, the Q&A. Um, but before I do, I just want to say this has been wonderful. I really am thankful, Dr. Ruiz, uh, Kathleen, Keith, Wynn, I'm, I'm thankful for all of you uh, for, for coming and talking about uh, food in Los Angeles. I hope it's whetted everybody's appetite, so to speak, but also like giving you some, some weightier things to chew on. I apologize for the pun. Okay, um, Wynn, you're gonna, you're, if you wouldn't mind answering, 24 hours in LA, $20 on hand, we'll, we'll end with this. Where are you going? Okay, I thought about this, and before I get back to work here at the Four Seasons Landscaping over here, <laughs> I, um, I wanted it. So here is a version of it. There's so many different options. So I would go to, uh, first for breakfast, I would go to Huge Tree Cafe in San Gabriel. Um, you want to get their, uh, their they, have, they make a scallion pancake that's encrusted in egg. It's such a good uh, breakfast and eat it with like, they make this uh, savory soy milk you dip it in or you drink. I think that's like, I feel like that's like $5. Okay, so it's $5 right there. I, what? And I don't mean this in a bad way, but while he is still alive, I'd probably go to Bill's Hamburgers down the street from me here in Van Nuys. Mm -hmm. An 80 plus year old guy named Bill. It's actually known as Bill and Hiroka Burger, which is named after his ex-wife. His ex-wife. That's right. <laughs> he, he, he works with his ex-wife and his current wife in this little shack. He's used the same griddle for like decades and it gives this incredibly seasoned flavor. And by the way, the burgers, just to be honest with you, I've seen like, I've seen the patties he uses. He uses like, like uh, it's either like Costco or Smart Final, but it goes to show you that's not always about the ingredients, but how you treat it. And that's like a six dollar, no seven dollars now. Crap. Okay, seven dollars. I think it's seven dollars now. So the burger and the breakfast that's thirteen. And then I now and what I do now, I tend to eat a lighter dinner than a heavier lunch. So I'd probably go eat like a bowl of pho. My favorite pho place in. Uh, I'm going back to San Gabriel. Sorry. Um, I probably would go to uh, a Fafle, but the one in El, the one in El Monte, which is the original one, but it might thirteen dollars. I really want to save that six dollars. I'm gonna get the six dollar bowl just so I can get you one more thing, okay? Because then I would then go for the late night munchies. I would drive out all the way out to San Bernardino, and I'm not gonna get a fruit. I mean, they're okay. We're gonna the the donut man is famous for their fruit donuts. I love that. That's not what I love the most. I love any other actual donut. If I, you know what, what I'll do is I'll take the dollar I have left, I'll scrounge around for change in the bottom of my, my car, and I'll go get a tiger tail at uh, the Donut Man and finish it off. And that breakfast, lunch, dinner, and the late night snack, and that's what I would do. I mean, that's that's a death row last meal, as, as you mentioned earlier. That sounds perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Wynn. Mark, that's uh, $20. <laughs> yeah. That's hard. <laughs> that's hard, man. That's hard. That's... Yeah, no, I mean, that is, you know, but LA, I think that's one of the great things about it. You can really, I mean, for me, I would go to uh, Olympic uh, out in East Los Angeles at the old Sears building and just go, mm -hmm. go eat the tacos right down Olympic, right? Marisco Salisco, uh, the, you know, various Berea places, El Russo now doing the Sonoran style. So 
And it's, you know, I think you can make $20 stretch there. And yeah, if you don't without think, a car. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, that part. That Must part, bear. That part, yeah. uh, all right. Well, thank you all so, so much. Um, please, uh, you know, check out uh, Button Mash, all flavor, uh, no grease. Um, <laughs> go to Moonwater Farm. Uh, read and go to and attend Dr. Luisa's classes, read, read uh, her work as well. Thank you all tremendously. Um, I, I could have gone for two hours with this, but unfortunately I really do have to go. So <laughs> take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Until next time, guys. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Wonderful yeah. chat with all of you. Yeah, great Wonderful. to be Thank you. <laughs>